Good morning and good afternoon wherever you are. I hope everything is well with all of you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this webinar. Our guest speaker today is Yap Veselius, who is an experienced Microsoft Exchange MVP or Most Valuable Professional and a specialist in Microsoft Messaging and Collaboration. Whether your Exchange service is on-premise or moving to the cloud or both, YAP will cover all the technical aspects of upgrading your current messaging Microsoft Exchange. Before we start, uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, you are all muted to ensure we provide the best audio for the audience. So please, if you have any questions, pop, up into, pop them up into the Q&A box, and YAP will respond to all the questions at the end of the presentation. With that, I'll pass that stage to Yap. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Good morning for me. If you are in the APEC region, I think it's good afternoon. Um, my name is Yap Aselius, and today I'll be uh, talking about uh, upgrading your on-premises Exchange Server environment, something that's a hot topic at the moment. And the agenda for today is uh, the problem statement and the options you have like staying on premises, migrate to the cloud in a hybrid environment, or migrate to the cloud entirely in a Big Bang environment. Uh, during this presentation, I'll be talking to uh, talking about uh, Exchange Online, but sometimes I say Office 365, but of course, uh, when I do say Office 365, I mean Exchange Online, just to be sure. Uh, well, my name is uh, Jaap Zelius. I'm 53 years old. I'm married. I have three sons, 14, 18, 19 years old. And I'm a messaging and collaboration consultant, and I have been in this space since somewhere the mid-90s. And my first Exchange deployment was actually uh, in 97, I guess, which was Exchange 5. Uh, my focus in, is still on Exchange and Office 65, of course. At the moment, uh, it's still a lot of exchange work, but I also do Skype for Business slash Teams identity management, everything around Office 365 combined with your on-premise environment. I also do some blogging on my own site, japaselius.com. Uh, I do local community presentations, and every now and then I do webinars like this because I like it. Um, I'm also the author of Exchange 2010 and Exchange 2013 books. Uh, I tried writing Exchange 2016, 2019 books, but I'm afraid writing books is interesting, but yeah, uh, surpassed by information on the internet. Um, and currently, I do a lot of work with hybrid exchange migrations. So the problem statement is that uh, Exchange 2010, the support for Exchange 2010, ends on October 13 this year. It's only four months from now. And the problem won't stop working, but it's no longer supported, which means you don't have any escalation path to Microsoft. And I'm not sure if you use an escalation path at this point. But more important is there won't be any more security fixes. And there will be no more support for Exchange 2010 hybrid. So if you are still on Exchange 2010, you will have to act quickly to move away from that. Um, Exchange 2013 support ends on April 11, 2023, so you have uh, some more time left there. But for Exchange 2013, no more cumulative updates are released, and only security updates are released when needed. No, no new features will be released for uh, Exchange 2013, not even for Exchange 2013 hybrid. So new features uh, are released uh, for Exchange 2016 or 2019 although very limited, but they will be. Uh, as a side note, Exchange 2016, 2019 support will end on October 14, 2025. So that's five years from now. And what happens after that, that's, I don't have this crystal ball, so I'm not sure. And the focus for this presentation is on Exchange 2010 migrations. So what options do you have? The only option you actually have is upgrading your Exchange 2010 environment, whether it is on-premise or uh, online. And there are three different uh, paths you can take. You can take path one and stay on-premises. 
uh, move from Exchange 2010 to Exchange 2016. Um, there is no direct upgrade path from Exchange 2010 to Exchange 2019. So if you want to move to Exchange 2019, you have to move to Exchange 2016 first and then continue to Exchange 2019. Or another path is to move to Exchange 2013 and then from 2013 to 2019. That's because the N-2 uh, support from Microsoft. It's just not supported. And I still have a lot of customers who don't move to the cloud at this moment for whatever reason. Mostly it's legal reasons. Um, and customers that stay on premises 100%. They are looking to the cloud but not able or willing to move to the cloud. The second path is to migrate to the cloud in a hybrid scenario and that covers 99% of all my work. Uh, we build an, uh, an exchange hybrid environment and move uh, mailboxes to, uh, to exchange online. Um, during that hybrid configuration, we can add uh, an Exchange 2016 server in the mix or in the beginning and move mailboxes to Exchange 2016 or Exchange Online. And the last path, which I will cover briefly, is move to Exchange Online 100% without keeping any uh, resources on premises. This is basically the same story, but that's for later use, of course, if you want to download the presentation. So the first path is stay on premises and upgrade to Exchange 2016. And the first thing, of course, you have to do is design your Exchange 2016 environment. That's something we uh, were used to do uh, years ago because in Exchange 2010, 2010, you had to take special care for this, but you have to design your Exchange 2016 environment properly for, uh, for use. You can do that using the Exchange Requirement Calculator for designing this. And based on the number of users per server and the hardware being used, the calculator determines the number of Exchange servers you use. And the uh, Exchange Calculator is an interesting tool uh, to figure out how to design your environment. And you can uh, use a various number of users, for example, different types of hardware if you want to use virtualization or not, or the disk configuration, all kinds of stuff. Um, for example, um, every server has a different uh, processor in it, and you can use uh, a, a performance value called the spec int value for this specific processor, uh, which um, is going to inf influence the um, the, the working of your Exchange uh, server. So when you look at the, uh, the calculator, you can enter several variables in there, like if you want to use a server uh, virtualization, if you want to use um, the, the, the number of users, if you want uh, multiple servers, how many copies of the database you want, all kinds of variables you can enter there, and you can play with these numbers. And in uh, different other tabs on the uh, calculator, you can see the result, how many users per server you have, for example, how many databases per server, if you need a DAG, how many DAGs you need, and it also determines the uh, size of the databases and the, the, the storage you need for this particular server. And for uh, a large uh, environment, you need a couple of days to figure out the optimal configuration for your server. It's the, 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 the first day you are playing with it, it can be a bit confusing, but it's, it still is a very useful tool. The next step is to build your Exchange servers, of course, and uh, always use the latest version of Exchange 2016. Uh, in my presentation, I said CU16, but uh, actually yesterday, the update 17 was uh, released, but then I already uploaded my presentation. Um, um, my recommendation is to use uh, Windows 2016 instead of uh, Windows 2012 R2 because support already ends in uh, 2023. Exchange 2016 is not supported to run on Windows 2019, and Exchange 2016 is also not supported on Server Core, so you have to be aware of that. If you are building multiple servers, I always recommend uh, using PowerShell to uh, install the prerequisite software and uh, when installing the server itself, I always recommend using the unattended uh, deployment option for consistency. Um, uh, Michel de Roy, a fellow MVP here in the Netherlands, has an uh, unattended install script 
which you can run, which will do everything for you. Well, one thing is uh, when you install uh, Exchange 2016 into your production environment, be aware of the service connection point that is created during installation. And the service connection point is used for auto discovery purposes. And if you are not aware of that, it can have disastrous results because Outlook clients can pick up the service, the new service connection point, which is not configured yet, and it will give erroneous results back to the Outlook client, and your Outlook client can crash. Uh, Tony Murray, another uh, MPP, created a PowerShell script set auto discover SCP value dot PS1, which will look for the creation of the uh, service connection point and edit the correct value to minimize the risk of issues. And when the server is installed, you have to configure it, set the virtual uh, directories, uh, configure SSL certificates, relocate the transport database to a different disk. Uh, Microsoft provides a, a PowerShell script for that, uh, create database availability groups, uh, configure backup load balancing, and uh, also very important and not really technical, uh, you have to train your IT staff, you have to work on documentation and processes like backup, restore, and disaster recovery, for example. Uh, train your IT staff is important because uh, management of your Exchange server is uh, moving away from the Exchange Management Console, which is a very useful tool to uh, the Exchange Admin Center, still GUI, but uh, there's less functionality in there, and uh, lots of uh, configuration is now done in uh, PowerShell. So you have to train your users on PowerShell because it's, it's different. Client access in coexistence is, uh, can, be, can be confusing. If your clients connect to uh, Exchange 2016 and your resources are still um, in Exchange 2010, the client connection uh, or the client request is actually proxied from Exchange 2016 to Exchange 2019, or from Exchange 2016 to Exchange 2010, sorry. This is called a down-level fun uh, functionality. So Exchange 2016 client access can access 2010 resources. Exchange 2010 client access, on the other hand, cannot access resources on Exchange 2016. So if your clients continue to connect to Exchange 2010 and you move a mailbox to Exchange 2016, the client is not able to connect to that. So you have to be aware of that. So um, at one point, you have to, uh, or you have installed your Exchange 2016 server, and you have to change the way your clients access the Exchange environment. And uh, that's actually the most important part. In coexistence, resources will be managed from Exchange 2016. So there's also uh, a down-level functionality there. Load balancing for Exchange 2016 is uh, different than Exchange 2016. In Exchange 2010, it was relatively simple. There was one virtual server that connects to multiple Exchange 2010 CAS servers. That's the way load balancing works, of course. And the load balancer checks, does an ICMP check for CAS availability. And in Exchange 2010, you have a stateful connection to Exchange 2010 CAS. In Exchange 2010, 2016, load balancing is more advanced. Um, you have, still have a virtual server that connects to multiple Exchange 2016 server, but each virtual server has multi multiple sub-virtual servers, and one sub-virtual server for each service. So there is a sub-VS for OWA, for ECP, for EWS, for MAPI, for Outlook, anywhere, everything. And each sub-VS checks for the availability of this server, and it uses the Exchange Managed Availability on the Exchange server. If the service is running properly, uh, the Exchange server will publish a healthcheck.htm file. You can actually see it by going to, uh, say, localhost slash oi slash healthcheck.htm, and it will return a 200 OK page. And the camp load balancer is using this page for checking the services. It also has a stateless connection uh, to the Exchange 2016 server. So it's, it's uh, more advanced, but it's way easier to, uh, to manage. Um, it's, it's always good to use 
the templates provided by Camp to configure your load balance. You can do it manually, but the uh, using templates is just a matter of uh, seconds to configure your uh, load balance, or maybe a minute or two. When you are at this point, uh, configuring the load balancer and changing your client access to uh, Exchange 2016, the hard part is over. Um, when it comes to, uh, for example, downtime, uh, your users can face some downtime at this moment because you have to switch client access from 2010 to 2016. When you have uh, changed the client access, you can start moving mailboxes. Mailboxes can be migrated in, in batches using the new migration batch or as individual mailboxes, it's just what you prefer. And you can migrate mailboxes based on departments, on mailbox database, or server, whichever way you prefer. It's, it's fully transparent or seamless, and users won't see any difference if their colleagues or their own mailbox is migrated to Exchange 2016 or not. Also, free busy information, everything is fully transparent. Outlook clients, Outlook 2010 uh, and higher are fully supported, but I have also seen Outlook 2007 work fine as well, although it, it's not recommended because of support and, and security, of course. Uh, very recently, I have seen Outlook 2003 clients, and these will definitely stop working. Uh, migration performance can be an issue because for larger organizations, you have to move multiple terabytes of data from one environment to the other, and that, that it takes time to move so much data. What I typically do is synchronize the mailboxes during working hours and finalize the migration of business hours, for example, in the, in the evening and during the night, and the next morning users uh, start their outlook Outlook will see that the mailbox has moved and maybe they have to uh, restart their Outlook client and they can continue working. If you finalize during business hours and users having difficulties connecting to Exchange 2016, you can recycle the AutoDiscover Apple and IAS manager just to refresh the AutoDiscover configuration and your clients will connect. Um, if, you do a, if you request a move request information using the get move request, and pipe it into the move request statistics. That can be a very scary um, experience because it will uh, show all kinds of uh, error messages stalled due to target processor, whatever error messages, which basically means the request is queued and waiting to be processed. Um, it, it can stay here for some time. It can change over time, but the only thing is you have to be patient, and in the end, it will move all your data. But uh, performance can be an issue here. When you have moved all your mailboxes to Exchange 2016, uh, you can decommission your Exchange 2010. Um, but decommissioning, I always say, don't decommission the next day. Uh, Outlook clients may want to connect uh, to Exchange right after the migration, but in a week or a week or two, you can uh, gracefully decommission your server. Um, do not turn off your Exchange server, because if you have a VM, it's just easy to turn it off and delete it. You have to remove it properly, because you want all your Exchange 2010 information removed from Active Directory in a proper way. So the second option is to move to the cloud, and I see that happen a lot. And you can create your Exchange 2010 hybrid environment, which is fully supported. Um, there's absolutely no need, no real need to in install an Exchange 2016 called a hybrid server into an existing Exchange 2010 environment just because you can do it. And the question is, what is actually an Exchange hybrid server? And uh, the hybrid server is just a server when you run the hybrid configuration wizard. And you can use Exchange 2016 to connect to uh, Exchange Online, but you can also use Exchange 2010. Uh, to connect to uh, Office 365 or Exchange Online. You can also run the hybrid configuration wizard on a single Exchange 2010 environment. No problems whatsoever. Uh, but what's the advantage of installing an additional Exchange server for the migration, which can be, of course, an Exchange 2010 server, is you can offload uh, traffic between Exchange Online and Exchange On-Premises. 
Now the uh, SMTP and uh, free busy information is not that much. Then when you start moving mailboxes, it can be quite some traffic. And it can be interesting to offload this traffic to, um, to a, a separate server. And uh, yeah, you can migrate mailboxes first and then upgrade to Exchange 2016. Uh, but I also see a lot of customers installing Exchange 2016 uh, before they start moving. What if you add an ex additional Exchange 2016 server? And this is still is what you see a lot. Exchange is installed as a hybrid server, but nothing is changed to the client access configuration. Now, if we go back to uh, what I said in the previous section, uh, there is no up-level uh, up uh, proxy functionality in Exchange 2010. So if you do this, the official way is that you have to change the way client access enter your Exchange environment. So all your clients, including Office 365, Exchange Online, need to access Exchange 2016 and um, then proxy to Exchange 2010. Um, you can uh, continue to use uh, your uh, normal FQDN like autodiscovercontoso.com, webmail.contoso.com, uh, but you still see a lot of um, configuration using additional servers with FQDN like hybrid.contoso.com just for Office 365 communication. And while this is possible, and especially if you know what you're doing, uh, it's not the official way to do it. So uh, this is what I uh, typically do is uh, uh, install an Exchange 2016 server, uh, change the way client access, and then uh, move to uh, Exchange Online. But if you do this, you're already halfway a migration to Exchange 2016. And again, just like in the previous section, when you make this change, the hard part is over. You have your hybrid configuration. Everything has changed. Everything is running fine and uh, you can continue working and move your mailboxes to Exchange Online. Um, at the same time, if you decide to keep uh, uh, certain mailboxes on premise, you can move these to Exchange 2010, of course, and then later on decommission Exchange 2010. So the prerequisites for Exchange uh, Hybrid, you need to have uh, Azure AD Connect in place and synchronize all recipients you need in uh, Office 365. Your mailboxes in Exchange 2010 will show up as mail-enabled users in Exchange Online. So if you go to the Exchange Admin Center, you can go to Contacts, the Contacts tab, and you will see the mailboxes there in uh, Exchange 2010. So these will be mail-enabled users. And once you move a mailbox, the mail-enabled user will be uh, converted to a mailbox. On the other hand, the mail old mailbox in Exchange 2010 will there be uh, converted to a mail-enabled user. Um, the SMTP domain, of course, needs to be uh, added to uh, Office 365 to your tenant. Uh, you need uh, Exchange 2010 Service Pack 3, the latest roll-up fixes. Uh, if you install Exchange 2013 or 2016 in the mix, be aware of the N-1 cumulative update. Another one no pre-authentication before the Exchange hybrid server or before the Exchange server. Microsoft does not want any pre-authentication between Exchange Online and Exchange 2010. So if you still have a TMG server, for example, you have to be very careful not to place this in between. Also, uh, SMTP devices uh, between Exchange Online and Exchange 2010 or 2016 on premise is not supported. Um, you uh, the only exception is the edge transport server in between. So Microsoft wants a dedicated connection between Exchange Online and Exchange 2010. You can use a firewall, of course, that, that's no problem. And the reason is that because Microsoft uh, does that because this way they can uh, treat mail between Exchange Online and Exchange on premise as internal mail. And secure mail. It's just secured by uh, using certificates, so that's absolutely safe. You can also uh, configure your firewall or your Exchange server, your um, receive connector, only to accept connections from Exchange Online. That's not a big deal either. And you see that happen a lot. So no other customers can connect to your Exchange server or no other uh, SMTP servers. 
So when you have Exchange Hybrid, you can migrate mailboxes to Office 365. You can also move mailboxes from uh, Office 365 back to your Exchange on-premises. So you have the offboarding options. Uh, you have secure mail, cross-premises, treated as internal mail. You have free busy information, cross-premises, mail tips. You can still open mailboxes, cr cross-premises, everything continue to work. Uh, permissions cross-premises and uh, when you have migrated all your resources off of Exchange 2010 to Exchange 2016 or Exchange Online you can decommission Exchange 2010 just like uh, in the previous section. But how about that last Exchange server? Um, that has always been a problem, that still is a problem um, and I do still get a lot of questions about it you need to keep that last exchange server on premises. Whether you like it or not, it is still used. It's not used for mailboxes. Even if you have moved all your mailboxes to exchange online, you still need that last exchange server it's for management purposes because the source of authority where all the user objects are managed is still Active Directory and Azure AD Connect synchronizes your identities to Office 365 to Azure Active Directory but they are still managed on premises and even if you have your mailboxes in exchange online all the exchange attributes are managed in on premises active directory you can use that you can do that using atzi edit or any third party application but it's not officially supported and the only official way uh, for managing this is using an exchange server it can be a very simple 8 gigabyte one processor virtual machine running Exchange 2016. If you have no mailboxes on it, you can use a hybrid license at no cost, but it's only used for maintenance purposes. What I do see a lot is that last Exchange server is still used for internal SMTP relaying applications running on premises using the on premises uh, Exchange server for relaying messages to mailboxes in Exchange Online or maybe to recipients on the internet. Does it need to be highly available? It depends a bit on the relaying you need, uh, but specifications are typically fairly low. Microsoft is fully aware of this problem, and uh, it is a problem. Now, if you have an Exchange server, um, you are used to your own Exchange server on premises, but support, suppose you do a migration from Gmail to Office 365. And then in the end, you need to install an Exchange server on premises for maintenance server, an Exchange server on premises they never had. So that's, that's a bad story. Microsoft is aware of it and is working on it. So <coughs> the bad thing is they have been saying two years ago at Ignite, we are aware of it and we are working on it. But yeah, it's a, it's a complex problem. And the last thing I want to cover is um, migrate to the cloud like a big bang scenario where you move all your resources to the cloud. Um, I typically see this for uh, smaller environments, um, like 100 mailboxes uh, or less. It's also known as the cutover migration. There's Microsoft tools you can use and uh, any other third party tools like BitTitan, for example, but there are more tools. And what you do basically is export your accounts from Active Directory and from Exchange and import these in Office 365. Uh, no Azure AD Connect is used, so everything is managed online. And you synchronize mailbox da data with Office 365. And this synchronization can be do done by uh, Microsoft tools uh, themselves or by the third party. You synchronize the mailboxes and, and finalize on Friday night. When you finalize it, you change the MX record, you change the auto -disc discovery record, and during the weekend, you complete the auto configuration of your clients and on Monday morning, everybody start working. Then you can decommission your exchange server, your exchange on premises, and everything is moved to the cloud. Everything is moved to the cloud from an exchange pers perspective, of course. I mean, your file server stuff, everything on premise is still there, of course. Uh, and I think it's because of my client base, I typically work with the larger customers. I do see this happen, but I don't see this too often, but that's because of my uh, my personal situation, I guess. So we ended with the, the summary and uh, the, the Exchange 2010 support. 
will end in October 2010. That's only a couple of months from now. So if you are still running Exchange 2010, you have to do something. Uh, the product won't stop working, but from a security perspective, you want to move away from Exchange 2010. And you can move to Exchange 2016 on-premises um, and then hop to Exchange 2019, or you can migrate to Office 365 using the Exchange hybrid configuration. And that's what the majority of my clients are doing at the moment. And the advantage of the hybrid is you, can, you have a seamless uh, environment. It's fully transparent. You can move mailboxes to Exchange Online. You can move mailboxes back to Exchange 2016. Uh, you, you can have all kinds of um, configurations there. You can use the Exchange 2010 hybrid. You can use an Exchange 2016 hybrid uh, as part of an Exchange 2010-2016 coexistence. It can be a bit more complex, and if you don't pay uh, enough attention during the configuration, you can uh, get into different kind of issues. And that's my uh, my advantage as, an, as a consultant in this space. I am asked by a lot of customers who run into issues, uh, and I have to fix them. Um, when configured correctly, it's 100% seamless, and, but it's not always configured uh, correctly, and it can be more complex than you think at first sight. So you have to be aware of it. It's, it's fully supported. It looks easy, but it can be more complex, especially when you have large environments. So that was my uh, presentation for uh, this morning, this afternoon. And uh, we can continue with the questions. I have a few questions here. And uh, the first one, in, in terms of exchange deployment in a hybrid exchange deployment, what is the strategy for the witness server? Um, the witness server is, of course, part, part of the database availability group. That's not different than uh, Exchange 2010. So if you have, for example, a file server used as a witness server for Exchange 2010, you can still use that particular file server for um, the, uh, the witness server in Exchange 2016. Now, in Exchange 2010, you can also use a client access server or a hub transport server, and that's no longer possible in Exchange 2016 because you only have the mailbox server containing all the roles. So you need an additional server for the witness server. I've been talking about the, uh, the templates for uh, configuring load balances. These are available on the CAMP website. So if you search for download uh, load balancer templates, you can find all kinds of, uh, literally hundreds of templates for Exchange, for Skype, for Business, for Link, for RDP, for whatever services. Um, another question. If I'm running on Exchange 2007, Exchange 2010 is going to be end of life by this year. How do I upgrade to Exchange 2019? If you are running on Exchange 2007, my recommendation would be to move to Exchange 2013. Then you are supported for at least three more years. Uh, you can continue running, and um, then you can upgrade from Exchange 2013 to Exchange 2019. Another question, can we use Windows Network Load Balancing for Load Balancer uh, Exchange 2016? Yes, that is possible, but uh, it's still not possible in combination with the database availability group. So I would not do it. Let's see, another one. It's better to be in on-premise or Office 365 for 30 percent uses yearly mailbox size is 70 gigabytes. Uh, it depends on uh, a bit on the, on, the, on the configuration or your organization, of course, where you uh, want to host your mailboxes. Let's see if we have, ha do we have some more questions? I have to scroll this one. Mark is answered. Mark is answered. Let's see. Templates, hybrid strategy. More questions. Are there more questions? Any more questions? I don't see any more questions coming in at the moment. Yeah, I think you answer pretty much all of them. If there is any other questions, 
from the audience. This is the last chance. No, I'm afraid no more questions, but you still can uh, find me uh, on the internet, of course. You can ask questions using your local camp uh, representative, of course, and they will end up somewhere in my mailbox. So that's that's no problem. That's good. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think we have one more question actually just popped in, if I'm not mistaken. Um, no, I think that's, we're good. Yeah, it's, uh, okay. No, no. Yep. Okay, well, so uh, thanks for your time, everybody. Yep. And uh, thank you, Yap, for the nice presentation and for sharing your knowledge. Um, More than I welcome. I wanted to... I just wanted to um, remind people that this webinar is going to be on demand um, after about 10 minutes uh, after the webinar is over. And so you can download or you can go back to the link that you uh, used to come in and watch the webinar um, and then revise all the information that you have shared. Um, you also have links under the attachments and links, uh, which are resources that you can uh, download and then go to to use um, and in addition to the presentation that provided. And you can go to thecamp.com um, to get any other information related to load balancers. With that, um, I think we're all good. Uh, thank you very much again for everybody to participate in this webinar and have a great day wherever you are. Thank you.